Following the amalgamation of 1914, Nigeria was described in some historical literatures as a creation of the British. With over 250 ethnic groups who parade very diverse cultural backgrounds, the people of Nigeria have intermingled with one another through trade and commerce, using horses' footpaths and waterways as means of movements long before the advent of colonialism. Nigeria is a country that is totally blessed. She's blessed not only in natural resources, she's also blessed in human resources. And above all, she's very free from natural disasters, a huge blessing. Well, Nigeria is also referred to as the giant of Africa because of her might and all the blessings. She became a nation in 1960 when she got her independence from the Great Britain. And the activities to mark that great opportunity all kicked off in Lagos. That was a major hub of the celebrations and the major place that took a big stand in the whole of this was the race course. From the name the race course, you know that they used to have horse racing there and were also used to mark the day to celebrate our fallen heroes at the race course too. Now at that point, Nigerians from all walks of life joined their nationalist leaders like Zik of Africa, Awolowo and Amadu Bello to mark her freedom. instrument of independence was handed over to our very first Prime Minister, Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa. And this all happened at the race course, which is now known as the TBS, Tafawa Balewa Square, amidst a lot of funfair and celebrations. Welcome to a special outing of our history, and today is an independence outing, and we're wishing all Nigerians a beautiful celebration as you join us on the program. Welcome, I'm your host, Cordelia Obe. Whatever our colonial experiences were, Nigeria became independent on the 1st of October, 1960. Then I was a young boy and uh, I was born here in Lagos. Uh, the feeling that day of independence, the spirit then wasn't what we're seeing now. We're so happy. They gave us flag, they gave us cup, they cooked for us, and we participated in the marching at uh, TBS. And that we'll call it race course in those days. But today we'll call it Tav uh, Tavabalawa Square. What was important to us was that uh, we were being brought to the field to do a, a match pass that uh, we are having our independence. So. I was at the University of Ibadan and we had a real celebration. Uh, we organized a conference on Nigeria on the eve of independence. We were all very happy because we know that this country it's a blessed country. We saw a military man making in a parading, going around. So many people gather in different places. It's a place like where a uh, football field is. We see people gather in that place. So that time we have uh, a one court room, I can say, where we normally go and watch through television. That is where we can gather in that place and watch. 
So we are they are in different story from here, here from that, that Nigeria now is, is uh, having their own independent our history. history. Different constitutional conferences were held, but the one that broke the camel's back was the 1957 Constitutional Conference where a national government was established under the leadership of Abubakar Tafawa Balewa on October 1, 1960. Nigeria finally got her freedom. The first set of leaders that midwived Nigeria from independence were certainly very determined and committed to working for the good of the country. Nigeria was led by late Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa as Prime Minister, while late Dr. Namdi Azikwe was the Governor General until 1963, when Nigeria parted with British legacy and became a republic. We came to the First Republic against the background of colonialism. That is, we were being administered by foreigners. And it was by gradual degrees that they considered the right to serve government to us. So we came in without much experience, certainly with little or no experience in parliamentary democracy. So they didn't have enough experience of living together of seeing themselves as one until they gain independence. After six years of tendering the constitution bequeathed to them by colonial master under the parliamentary system of government, the military toppled the civilians for what they described as an unwieldy and corrupt regime. With a promise to sanitize a society and ensure a better country, the crisis that followed that coup in 1966 eventually precipitated into a 30-month civil war which almost tore the country apart. Our history. My dear compatriots, we have arrived at one of the greatest moments of the history of our nation, a great moment of victory for national unity and reconciliation. Between 1970 when the civil war ended and 1979 when the Second Republic was instituted, the military still held power with their unified command structure. General Murtala Mohammed was later to lead a coup against General Gowon's regime in February of 1975, but was also cut short by a counter coup led by Colonel Buka Suka Dimka. That counter coup was foiled. And Major General Basanjo emerged as leader of government that eventually handed over power. To a civilian regime. And bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. To the Federal Republic of Nigeria. By 1979, the commencement of the Second Republic, Alaji Shew Shagari, became the first executive president under the presidential system of government, which was embraced in place of the parliamentary system in the period after independence. In and out of the Second Republic, the Shagari administration was credited with a number of achievements. The Third Republic commenced in 1983 with Alaji Shew Shagari still elected as executive president for the second time. But the Third Republic was short-lived because the military under Major General Muhammad Buhari observed some ills bedeviling the Shagari regime, including corruption and indiscipline, 
and took over power that same year, 1983. Indiscipline, corruption, spandemania, misuse and abuse of public office for self or group aggrandizement, which had assumed debilitating proportions in the last few years, will be dealt with ruthlessly, no matter whoever may be involved. There were a number of other coups and counter coups with the emergence of other military regimes, including those of President Ibrahim Babangida and General Sunny Abacha, for different reasons, with a short lived interim government led by Chief Ernest Shoneko in between. Our history. Since her independence in 1960 and all the celebrations, Nigeria has had her own fair share of leaders, be they in civilian clothing or in army uniforms. Now, these leaders have been able to achieve varying degrees of success or successes. But there are various schools of thought that will tell you also that Nigeria has experienced major challenges in the area of leadership and followership. This has brought the one-time giant of Africa to crossroads. And bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. To the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The Fourth Republic came into being on May 29, 1999, after 16 years of military rule. Chief Olusegun Gombasujo was elected as the civilian head of state, and he ruled until 2007 when late Umaru Yaradua was elected, from whom Goodluck Ebele Jonathan took over the reins of government, first as acting president and later an elected president. They have not really done as well as they should. After each military government leaves, the civilians have behaved like uh, what we say in history, the Bourbon. They've learned nothing and forgotten nothing. They come and seem to start afresh from where the military left them. They be as corrupt, if not more corrupt than when they came. They don't address the issue of uh, national cohesion, national integration, legislators, governors, and political office holders tend to fend for themselves rather than the nation. So at the end of the day, uh, we don't really say they have uh, been doing very well. The country struck oil in 1958 in Oiloibiri. Since then, Nigeria became a monoproduct economy with the neglect of agriculture and preference for the petrodollar with the result that our spending profile changed. We prospected for oil, exported it as our main source of income but we became an import-dependent country, importing all manner of goods and services, particularly from the 1970s, when we experienced a quantum leap in the demands for our oil, an era that analysts describe as the oil boom period. We have not been able to recover from that experience with the result that our economy is suffering a lot of setback occasioned by the dwindling resources from our oil exports. It uh, created a phenomenon referred to as Dutch disease, a uh, phenomenon where the exchange rate became very strong because of the significant receipts from oil exports. Now, one consequence of that is that your traditional exports like say in agriculture, um, because of your strong exchange rate, it's more expensive for the person who is importing it, or better put, what the farmer is receiving because of the exchange rates is now so small that it's better for him to go and be uh, a laborer for a construction company building the new infrastructure that you're using the revenues from oil. Uh, that sector of the economy, the non-tradable goods sector, like building Tafabala Square, Concrete Jungle, 
and all of that. When oil prices drop, as was the case in the volatile economy, you would not be able to sustain such a project and the construction company will lay off those workers. In the meanwhile, the farm they used to run would have run down. So that pattern led to a decline of a sector such as agricultural sector. Our educational developments has hardly produced the 20th century self-reliant graduates who should be employers of labor rather than job seekers. The structure and nature of our curricula under the military or civilian regimes has hardly witnessed any phenomenal change. I went to a free primary school under a winner war regime and we didn't pay anything. And I'm sure quite a number of us now who are maybe in our middle ages benefited from that free primary school because it it's really was an eye-opener for many of us. And in those days, the quality of education too seemed to be better than what we have now. Because even if somebody came with primary six, the person could compose a letter, at least could answer questions and so on. And of course, with school sat, I went to teach after school sat, and after A level. But these days, you talk to people who have a school sat and they can hardly express themselves. So you wonder what really is in the curriculum of the schools. The health and well-being of a people determines to a great extent the quality of life expectancy and contribution of the people to the overall development of the country. At independence, there was only one teaching hospital, which was the University College Hospital in Ibado, still retaining that name. And that is because we didn't have any university in Nigeria. We had the University College affiliated to the University of London. So that was more or less the only teaching hospital we have, or we had then. Now we have many teaching hospitals, many specialist hospitals. These are hospitals where you provide specialist and tertiary care in medicine. So they have multiplied tremendously. The rich and diverse social cultural backgrounds of Nigerian people confer on Nigeria a nation with very rich cultural and tourism potentials. But have we developed these to the overall benefit of the country as is obtained in other countries like South Africa, Kenya and others in Africa? We have a lot of tourist centers in Nigeria. And rather than promote it and make it look good, we are all uh, pushed to go in outside. Well, it is not wrong to travel, but we must show interest and believe and the enthusiasm in what we have. So in Nigeria, we must develop the belief in ourselves. This is the Nigeria that has Chino Achebe. This is the Nigeria that has Shoinka. This is the Nigeria that has uh, uh, any joko that broke through in cholera vaccine. There are many, in short, we have among the best scholars in the world coming from this planet and in this part of the planet. And we also know that these sources of tourism are here with us. Led by Montezuri, now Mikel, Aziz. Admittedly, sports has been a mass mobilization instrument in the hands of all governments because of its ability to situate Nigeria properly in the sporting map of the world. Football, be it senior or junior female or male has served to institute the bond of unity 
among Nigerians. Football United Nation, Nigeria, because we even if we are talking about tribalism, but with football we are together always. We enjoy football in this country. That's why if they are winning Nigeria, we are all are we all are annoyed over that. It brings us together because it brings Ibu outside like for me, like me now. I'm coming from Kogi City. And I'm living at the, at the police barracks here. It brings us together to be at, to be watching the match there. And now, now football, you know, just Yibo, Yoruba, both other countries together. Now football. Our history. In and out of different regimes since 1999, when this Fourth Republic commenced, it is obvious that our democratic institutions, especially the electioneering processes, have witnessed some marked levels of change, especially with the most recent one that brought President Muhammadu Buhari to power. It was a marked improvement from our previous practices. We all over since the inception of the uh, electoral process in Nigeria, there has been one complaint or the other. Either voters' registers are tampered with, uh, ballot buses are stuffed with uh, pre printed uh, ballot papers, or people even hijack and take away the whole listing. The uh, reforms that were put in place during the last elections were highly commendable. You had the use of uh, permanent voters' cards. You had uh, the use of uh, uh, card readers. You had the use of uh, several other things, which, to a great deal, uh, eliminated electoral malpractices. Elections and the possibility of voting in and removing leaders should become seamless by the people. It is only when this can happen, and often, that we can begin to say we are practicing real democracy with free and fair elections. Nigerians have renewed zeal and great optimism about the expected performance of President Muhammadu Buhari-led APC government. He has set out a tripartite agenda of fighting insecurity, corruption and diversifying the economy so as to give room for more employment and generally give the country a new lease of life. The three areas of focus are pretty important. Um, obviously, um, insecurity is a critical challenge facing Nigeria. Um, where there is uncertainty, you are likely to get much less by way of investment either by indigenous peoples or foreigners uh, because nobody wants to lose what little they have today. So they would rather not invest at all and keep what they have than risk losing it in an environment of uncertainty. Buhari is, uh, you know, his image uh, is enough, you know, to instill fear into the crooked ones your straightforward ones, those who like to cut corners, because uh, by his nature, he will not tolerate such a thing. The goodwill he garnered during the electioneering campaigns leading to his election and the invitation of the American presidents put together raised the profile of Nigeria's foreign policy with more of such invitations anticipated. To his critics, the Buhari administration is seen to be somewhat slow as also retorted by him in one of his interviews while on the visit to America. However, the administration is making progress in fighting insurgency, corruption, impunity and in discipline. In addition, there has been noticeable improvements in power supply and the administration is promising 
to improve the economy in due course. 55 years in a man's life, or even in a nation's life, is a lot. Enough time for somebody to sit down and take stock of where they're coming from and where they hope to go to and where they are at the any point in time. Now, the euphoria of Nigeria's independence has come and gone. Nigerians at that point had very high expectations. Are those expectations being met? That is a question. Now with that in mind, let's cast our mind back to a particular line in our national anthem, which encourages us not to forget all the struggles of our heroes past. The Buhari administration is set to diversify our economy and remove our attention from just crude oil and focus on other things like agriculture. It's also looking at also focusing a lot on security because when there is no security, hardly anything will prosper. And to also help in the area of employment for our team and youths and giving us a better lease on life, we're also looking at the area of mining, tourism, Again, I refer to it, agriculture and lots more. But how can that work? It's not a miracle. How will it work? You have to do your own bit while I do my own bit, while we shun corruption, because corruption is a killer any day and any time. If you do yours in your own little corner, I do mine in my own corner. We come together to make a bigger change in the bigger society definitely will get the desired change we want as a society. We wish you a very beautiful independence celebration. We wish Nigeria the best as we move on to greater heights and we'll see you next time. I'm Cordelia Obe wishing you a very, very beautiful day. And remember, if you do not know where you're coming from, you'll never really know where you're going to. Bye-bye.